there will be less globalization. In fact, I think we have entered an era of deglobalization. Uh, productivity will be less dynamic. As companies rewire their supply chains, there's going to be some hit to productivity. There'll be higher industrial concentration that tends also to be bad for productivity. Then on the demand side, there's a question mark as to how risk averse will people be coming out of this. I hope that the coronavirus is not the end of globalization, as some people are saying. Uh, the global economy is not a zero-sum game uh, in which one side gains only to the extent that the other side loses. It is and should be a positive-sum game. There are all sorts of advantages uh, that we get and other countries get out of globalization. Uh, the United States cannot afford to do everything inside our borders. Uh, that kind of an economy would, would cripple us, would make us much, much poorer than we are right now. Uh, developing nations, if they can't export to the United States and to other developed nations, they are going to stay poor. Uh, this is crazy and crazy talk to think that we can go back to the 1930s, uh, the kind of isolationism we saw then, and remember what happened then. Uh, that kind of isolationism made the Great Depression even worse. After this crisis, I think it's going to be very difficult for uh, policymakers to re-engage with the rest of the world. And by the way, the rest of the world is going to have a hard time re-engaging with us. So uh, our economy will be less globalized to all our detriment. Our economy will be diminished by that. And to step further away from that would be a, a significant error. We, we need to embrace the world. The, the, the process of globalization was a slam dunk success for Americans and the entire global economy and stepping away from it uh, is a serious area. But unfortunately, I think that's the direction we're headed in the wake of this crisis. It's a shame if we if we really abandon the global ecosystem we've created because it has actually created jobs all over the world. It's lifted a lot of economies around the world. Um, it's made us a more a global citizens. Um, and in many respects up until recently, I would say that it's, it's really allowed the world to operate in a more um, unified way. But obviously, currently, there are a lot of other strains and pulls on that on that whole ecosystem, in addition to the virus that I think are driving people to start to think about how do we make things in a more domestic, make decisions in a more domestic way. Stuff moves in, in container ships around the world incredibly cheaply, and container ships are not vectors for, for the virus. So the that's not a problem. But how much of the organization of that supply system depends upon personal contact. How much depends upon your your factory manager being able to fly out to China and talk with the suppliers there? And the answer is probably some of it. And we're going to clearly have a lot less, even, even after the pandemic, I think people are going to be less willing to do all of that. So this probably is a setback for globalization. The only question is the magnitude. Are we talking 5%? Are we talking 50%? And nobody really knows. The, the, the impetus, uh, original impetus for us uh, uh, when corporations in general for um, getting into the, a globalized supply chain was really around cost and efficiency. It was cheaper and it was efficient through just-in-time mechanisms or, and other um, systems to, to get products um, delivered from wherever it was in the world to the United States or and, and elsewhere, other places around the world. Um, we now obviously have I've seen um, some of the aspects of vulnerabilities, resilience in the COVID-19 uh, era, um, which are absolutely throwing these questions back onto the table regarding what's the ideal type of uh, supply chain. Um, you know, obviously, it, I, I think it's, there's still a lot of questions to be answered before I can tell you where it's going to land. But I will say that there are considerations around inflation um, and cost increases if we were to actually move the um, production lines back into, uh, let's say, the United States. So to have more resilient supply chain, you would need to have a more spread out production. So not so much uh, deglobalized, but globalized in a more even way. And that, I think, is potentially... Uh, uh, an opening for uh, other uh, countries that um, were in some sense before completely shut down from international trade by the complete dominance of China. 
And now it's like there is a reason actually to take a risk on a new country, which is that, well, what if something else happens in China, either pandemic or politic, which could, you know, is very much in the cards. And so long as individuals want to consume and find the best things that they want at the most affordable prices, essentially that's what drives globalization. If China does manage to recover itself and its own consumer starts to pick up more, the Chinese consumer is the single biggest global game in town and it certainly has been for the past five years. And I can't imagine whatever our politicians say that the world's greatest consumer companies are going to want to miss out on that. So yes, it's very fashionable for politicians in the West uh, to first of all blame China for everything that has happened with this horrible pandemic and then to follow it up by saying, you know, there's going to be a resetting of the agenda. But I can't imagine Apple, for example, to take such a pioneering uh, US consumer brand to suddenly decide it doesn't want to sell any iPhones to Chinese consumers. Well, I do think it is very likely that there will be change, is that a lot of companies that use uh, supply chains around the world to feed back into their own consumers will, will be very wary of having too much of it in China in the future. But I think, to be honest, that trend was underway already because China had become a lot more expensive the past few years as wages rose. Workplaces will be online and will be global because the best talent can be found anywhere. That won't go away. But what is happening in part is that as we understand the structural changes that are needed in the future, not only because of COVID, but also because of climate, the fact that we'll be moving to electric vehicles, the fact that we'll be moving to 5G, the fact that we'll be moving to renewable energy, there what's happening is not exactly deglobalization, but uh, industrial policy in the US in Europe and in Asia saying, we want a piece of that future. So we're going to protect our electric vehicle sector. We're going to uh, produce the wind turbines or the photovoltaics. We want a battery supply chain. So part of what is happening is a kind of manufacturing nationalism, which if it doesn't get out of control, is not so bad because it basically is a race to competitiveness in the new sectors of the economy. What I do worry about is something else, which is a geopolitical Cold War, which uh, a lot of hotheads in the United States want vis-a-vis -vis China. This is a dreadful mistake. Uh, God help us if we go that way. The idea that uh, isolationism protectionism makes absolutely more, no sense. We actually have to have more cooperation. Now, there will be some insourcing uh, uh, back to the United States. We, we ha have gone through what I sometimes call it hyper-globalization. Uh, we didn't focus on the importance of resilience in our supply chain. And uh, we, this is not only true in global supply chains, but every aspect of our economy, we make cars without spare tires. As we re, uh, bring jobs back, I'm not, uh, it's probably not going to be, uh, when I say we're gonna bring supply chain back, but it won't be jobs. Much of that work will be done by robots. And so we shouldn't think of this as a job program. It's a resilience program. And in fact, in many aspects of, the, of this kind of protectionism are going to backfire. If others reciprocate, our exports will go down. So the U.S. is better off than, than most other countries because we're big, we're relatively closed already, we have lots of resources, we have lots of people, we have lots of ingenuity. Um, if you're a small open economy, which, you know, people used to think, oh, if I want to be anything in this global economy, I want to be a small open economy because I can turbocharge my growth through the rest of the world. Well, this is no longer your environment. When we deglobalize, you want to have the characteristics of the US. So we are, in relative terms, we are better off. In absolute terms, we would be better off if we collaborated, but collaborated according to rules. So you took the example of China. Um, this is not a, just a U.S. issue. 
other countries have the same grievances as the US has vis-a-vis -vis China in terms of intellectual property theft, in terms of joint venture requirements, um, in terms of unequal access. So it's also important that other people in this globalization construct abide by the rules of globalization. You can't have a one-way option where you get to benefit, but you don't live up to your global responsibilities.